Today we'll recap the comedy and drama series Dickinson. Subscribe and hit like before we begin. The series starts with Steinfeld's Dickinson in her bedroom, busy composing poetry. Her sister Lavinia comes in and says their mom wants her to go get some water. Emily asks why their brother Austin can't do it, and Lavinia reminds her that he's a boy. Emily fires back. And this is the first clue that Emily isn't like most 19th century girls. Dickinson lives with her wealthy family in the 1800s Amherst, Massachusetts. She's stuck in a time where people judge her based on how well she handles household tasks and her success in finding a good marriage. When Emily walks into the kitchen, her mother informs her that yet another suitor is on his way to visit. In her unique way, Emily exclaims that she wishes she were a cat. Mrs. Dickinson responds by saying she's not a cat, and Emily quickly retorts, No, sadly, I'm a woman. In the family's drawing room, Mrs. Dickinson is now chatting with the young suitor, discussing the possibility of an engagement. Emily enters the room and casually plops down on the couch. She's determined to look unattractive to the opposite sex and annoy her mother, so she slouches even further into the cushions, adopting an intentionally disinterested posture. The young poet recognizes the suitor as George Gould, a guy she hangs out with in literature club. His eager smile suggests he wants more than just friendship, but Emily firmly places him in the friend zone. She confides, away from her mother's earshot, that she can't marry due to her literary dreams. She believes a husband would only get in her way. And besides, she's in love with someone else. George jokingly responds, who is he? I'll take care of him. But he's not very convincing. Emily tells George that he can't kill him, saying that she's in love with death. Nevertheless, this doesn't discourage George. He's determined to win Emily's affection by offering to get her poem published in the college magazine with her name on it. Emily is a bit worried about how her father might react, but she ultimately decides to go for it. George leans in for a kiss, but it's clear that Emily isn't into it. Later on, we discover that besides her passion for writing and fascination with death, Emily also shares a close friendship with Sue Gilbert. Surprisingly, Emily finds out that Sue is engaged to her brother, Austin. It's an awkward situation. Austin and Sue have a conversation with the Dickinson family about their future plans. Austin brings up the idea of relocating, which doesn't sit well with his father. Mr. Dickinson disapproves of the notion and suggests that Austin should instead consider joining his firm. To address this, Emily comes up with a clever plan. She lowers a basket on a string into the drawing room and asks Sue to meet her under the apple orchard. When the two girls meet, it's evident that neither of them is thrilled about the upcoming marriage. Emily makes two heartfelt requests of Sue. First, not to move to Michigan for her brother's job, and second, to always love her more than her brother. Sue stares into her friend's eyes and says that the first decision is up to her fiancé. But Emily doesn't need to stress about the second request. They then share a passionate kiss under the apple tree while getting soaked in the rain shower. We got a lesbian-honest relationship here. George successfully gets Emily's poem published. During a family dinner at the Dickinson home, a series of announcements are made. The engagement, Mr. Dickinson's plan to run for Congress, and Emily's debut in the literary world. The whole family is in turmoil, especially Mr. Dickinson, who strongly disapproves of a woman having literary ambitions, finding it scandalous. As a form of punishment, he instructs Emily to clean up after dinner and openly states his belief that she will tarnish the family's good reputation. Built over two centuries in Amherst, a provocatively dressed Emily visits Death, who kindly stops for her. Death's manner is strangely enticing, and he treats Emily with gentleness. She asks him when he'll take her away from this place for good, but he disappoints her by saying it won't happen for a long time, seeking comfort. She leans against his shoulder. Death predicts that she'll be the only Dickinson remembered for the next 200 years. Emphasizing that publicity isn't the same as immortality, he also mentions upcoming mortal events, including a civil war that will divide this nation. The scene switches back to Emily in her freshly cleaned white gown. Her mother ominously announces that another suitor will visit tomorrow. Emily responds dryly. Then, she finishes her poem because I couldn't stop for death. Later that night, she and her father make amends. Emily and Sue are in bed together feeling sad about the fact that once Sue is married, they won't be able to share a bed anymore. Sue's fiancé Austin Dickinson walks in on them unexpectedly. He comments, I don't know how you two fit in this tiny bed. After the girls get dressed, they make their way downstairs to the kitchen, where they encounter their lively new maid Maggie, who happens to be Irish. Mrs. Dickinson seems to be going through an identity crisis of sorts because with the new help in the house, she's no longer allowed to cook or handle household chores. Meanwhile, Emily enjoys not having to do housework and spends her free time reading the Springfield Republican. In the newspaper, she discovers that a famous geologist will give a lecture on his MT, Vesuvius explorations at Harvard University later in the day. Mr. Dickinson protests, saying Emily can't go because she's not a university student. 
and she can't become one because the education she needs as a woman isn't offered in a classroom. Sue and the Dickinson sisters head to the town's dressmaker to do some old-fashioned window shopping. Lavinia asks Sue and Emily if her hips were wide enough since she wants to appear fertile. However, Emily isn't preoccupied with looking fertile for the boys at all. Later in her bedroom, Emily twirls a top hat and vents her frustration to Sue about not being able to attend the Harvard lecture. Emily suggests the idea of donning men's clothing and sneaking into the volcano lecture in disguise. Sue hesitates and points out that such things only work in storybooks. Emily, still wearing the top hat, confidently declares that men are probably worried that if women learn at how things work, women will take over. Sue grins at her friend and partner's good looks and decides to join in on the scheme. They have a montage where they dress in men's clothes and dance. And so, the girls make their way to the prestigious university dressed in waistcoats and fake facial hair. George Gould quickly spots them but goes along with Emily's act. He asks, who are you young man? Emily agrees to George's request not to spill the secret, and he agrees to go along with the odd but intriguing boy named Lice and a periwinkle and his friend, Setable Butterfly. At first, it seems like their disguise as boys is going according to plan. Sue and Emily enter the lecture hall and blend in with the college guys. In the lecture, the speaker asks George to demonstrate a volcano model and gives a very detailed explanation of how tension builds before a volcano erupts, which is somewhat sensual. Emily's volcanic-related outburst accidentally reveals their true identities, and they are immediately thrown out of the lecture. Mr. Dickinson quickly finds out about the incident and reprimands his daughter for her embarrassing behavior. He insists that she read his essay titled On the Proper Place of Women. The mere title sparks frustration in Emily, prompting her to retreat to her room and start jotting down thoughts, which eventually turn into another famous poem. I have never seen volcanoes, even though Emily disagrees with her father. She does feel a sense of guilt when Mrs. Dickinson reminds her that evening that her father provides for her, and she should show gratitude through her behavior. To make amends, Emily decides to bake her father a loaf of bread as a gesture of peace. That evening, Sue and Emily end up in bed together, pondering their place in the world. Emily says she feels like Pompeii, a whole city covered in ash, frozen in time. She feels stuck and trapped. Sue responds by saying she can relate to what a volcano might feel like. They briefly escape from the world in the only way they know how, making pastrami sandwiches. Emily is caught in a storm at sea, desperately calling out for Sue, who's on the verge of leaving the ship. Emily suddenly wakes from this nightmare, gasping for breath, and lifts her head from her desk. Her pillow is actually made of scraps of parchment featuring her latest creation, Wild Nights. The poem hints at stormy nights to come. The Dickinson parents are preparing for a trip to Boston. Emily rushes down the stairs and dramatically pleads. Her father replies with a bit of humor, saying, I get why you prefer poetry over acting. Goodbye, and kisses her on the cheek. Mrs. Dickinson tells the girls to keep the house clean while she's away. It's like a 19th century version of throwing a party when parents are out of town. For instance, Austin comments to his younger sister Lavinia that every time they have a party he sees her with her hair tied around some guy's neck. Lavinia responds by saying it's a traditional way of courting. Emily, who starts the gathering, compares house parties to shipwrecks. Austin eventually agrees to the house party and views it as the perfect moment to announce his engagement. However, Sue, as expected, is in shoe and cites her financial situation as the reason. She attempts to postpone the engagement by suggesting she could work as a governess in Boston for a few months, but Austin isn't open to the idea. Austin isn't the only single guy in Amherst longing for someone he can't have. George still has his eyes on Emily. On the evening of the party, he shows up with white lilies, a symbol of death, which Emily thanks him for with a peck on the cheek. Unfortunately, poor George takes this as a sign of encouragement, deepening his experience of unreciprocated love. The party introduces some new faces, including Jane Humphreys, a snappily dressed mean girl, who is determined to win Austin's affections. She drops a hint to Emily that they could become sisters-in-law one day. Emily responds straightforwardly, saying, I guess if Austin married a flesh-eating demon, she'd still be my sister too. No college house party is complete without the popular girl or the cocky guy bragging about their romantic successes. In this instance, it's a guy named Joseph who's showing off his sexual prowess. He tries to prove it by flaunting a wallet filled with locks of hair from different girls. Austin and George are among those witnessing this show-off. Although the house party appears refined with fancy finger foods, can light, and well-dressed guests, it's still essentially a teenage gathering. Opium is the 19th century equivalent of recreational substances, and everyone at the party takes a few drops. Emily, influenced by the narcotics, hallucinates that she's dancing with a bee. Things become awkward when George interrupts their dance. The lovesick young man suggests that if he and Emily were married, they could have parties like that all the time. Emily, in a sober moment, advises George that he should marry a normal girl, not someone as unconventional as herself. 
George responds by saying maybe he likes crazy, and kisses her on the lips this time. Emily suddenly clutches her stomach and tells George that she feels ill as she rushes out of the room. After searching through a seemingly never-ending stack of petticoats, Emily realizes that she has just begun her menstrual period and lets out a cry of frustration and discomfort. Meanwhile, Jane asks Austin if Sue is a good fit for him, expressing doubts because of Sue's peculiarities and hinting at a romantic involvement between Sue and Emily. Austin rejects these notions, seemingly refusing to acknowledge them. But then, reality hits Austin hard when he discovers Emily's poem dedicated to Sue, titled Wild Nights, and walks in on Emily and Sue kissing in Emily's bedroom. This discovery triggers a heated argument between the Dickinson siblings over Sue's affection. Feeling overwhelmed by the situation, Sue asserts her determination to move to Boston and pursue a career as a governess. Apparently this is based on a few theories that Sue and Emily Dickinson may have had a lesbian relationship. Do you think this is true to history? What did you guys think? Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.